I wanted to, I've got uh, uh, several questions here, but I want to want to ask about the analysis data and get a sense for how much there is, because that's important to how you might proceed, you know, in the design process, the design meeting. Um, tell me, and then tell so tell me a little bit about that data. Tell me about the people that you sourced the data from, what I would call the analysis team, even if they were not meeting as a team, but, it, you know, you yes. met individually or whatever, however, and, uh, and the process. T so give me a little background about that, the analysis data and process and, and people. We, uh, my first idea is do the analysis meeting uh, in person, but because of my restrictions, we have to do it remotely. Uh, there are four people in this, in this analysis team. Uh, each one of them it, uh, is me, a subject matter specialist in one area of the, of the business. Uh, one is uh, the business leader, the owner. <laughs> you do the strategy, the planning, all the business related stuff. There are guys from the market team, they do the marketing for this company. We have a uh, <laughs> IT guy, <laughs> the guy who handle the, the technology. So, so, stuff. Let me, so are, will these be the people that you're going to facilitate for the design? Yes, because... Okay. But four is good, 12 is no, it's harder fine. to facilitate. So that was the key thing. You, what, you The last person, it's uh, a newcomer to the company. So okay. she, is, she is the our target audience yeah. representative. Yeah, no good. That's good to have somebody who can, you know, say that doesn't make any sense or, yeah. you know, I need more or whatever. That's, that would be helpful. So did you get, uh, so if, did you get the, how I do this, chunk it into areas of performance or major duties or whatever? Yes, but I, I didn't do as, as, in, as layout impact with online, uh, with a uh, synchronous meeting with everyone. What I had to do is to do an interview with them because right. uh, they uh, they never did uh, some analysis needed as we, as lay out in the linear ESD. Uh, so there is a lot of concepts that they are not, they don't grasp, they don't understand. If in and remotely, I, I find I find out it's very hard to explain some things or do some kind of work with them. So I use what I can and adapt the rest. Yeah, I did this as, as a an interview process, uh, individually, individually with each one of them. They, with several rounds, uh, of one of the, uh, one after a, after right. another. To yeah. get the information I need to do the the analysis report. All right. So yeah, and that's typical. I mean, out of out of my you know, two hundred projects or analysis efforts, probably I'm going to make this up. About at least half of them were not in a group process. They were traditional interviews, observations, document reviews, that kind of thing, which is the traditional thing that I was exposed to when I first started but so the question is do you have outputs identified with tasks that go with the outputs yes i have tasks that uh we had a we have two paths uh what we we decide the target audience and the performance of what it's business oriented to create to do the business business well see uh, starting with the concept, the cons uh, creating a product, validating that product, product, sell it online, and logistics to deliver. It. And we have okay. another another side. It's a, it's a technical, really technical stuff. It's performance gaps you have in the line of production that a newcomer might face. They they they, they already face it. A lot of times, still facing because new people come into the business and they have to retrain them. Right. So we have two two branches. Yeah, I say. One so do you have knowledge and skills 
uh, identified and linked back to this performance, but not that performance? It, it, do in, you the have that? in the technical side, they are very aware of the the the, the technical uh, skills and, and the behaviors uh, they they want to people have and perform in the, on the job. Okay. From the business side, it's not a documented process. They are right. starting to mapping and document all the process, business process now. That side, that branch, they don't have yet a, a skill made makers okay. yeah, to each every step of the way. They have uh, some high some clue, but they but yeah. you need to I uh, if I not I will do I need to to find out what is the skills they they want while I'm I'm mapping I'm mapping the process because it, they it's not it's not clear yet. For well, me all right. For so them. so so what uh, my questions are? Mm -hmm. I've dealt with this before when my business partners owners, co-owners of the business with me brought me incomplete analysis data, which meant yeah. in the design meeting, I had to do continue analysis, which you do all the time anyway. It's just that now it's a bigger uh, aspect of design. So, but there, but there's a way around this. So did you, is there any existing training or instruction or procedural guidelines that exist that you've Determined in your analysis? Yes. Uh, we had uh, own in house training and uh, content they brought from, uh, from other partners to train the, the, the team. And most of them, it's, it can be used as it is. is in most of them, it uh, will be reference for a new right. mod model or something like that because they are content oriented it's not performance yeah, exactly. oriented typical so the reason i'm asking this is that what we're going to be discussing in the design meeting is taking chunks of the analysis data and sorting it and then sequencing it we'll also be taking chunks of the knowledge and skills which might you you have some of that data yes. but some of it may be missing which is you're going to need to recover and then there's the existing content which you also will sort into a learning and development path or competency development path or whatever you need to call it um that was my question about that so has your so the people that you're working with they've seen the data you've produced they're okay with what you've got so far yes they are. Okay, good. It's been reviewed and approved, which is what I was looking for because yeah. it's bad to do, go to this next step without getting some sanctioning. Yeah. But you've got the owner of the business involved, and so mm -hmm. that should be okay. Um, when you do this virtually with them, um, what what tool are you going to use to do the virtual meetings? Yeah, that's the question. That's my doubt. Um, normally, I I will use a flip chart, and a, right, and a and a pen. But uh, we we have some tools that can be used: whiteboards. I can use a Padlet or some mirror board to emulate the the dynamics of the design design phase meeting. But I try to do that in the analysis phase. And uh, I've, I feel that people can stand uh, more than an hour or two hours of online meetings. It's right. very, people get tired very fast in you know, online, meet, uh, online meetings. Uh, so I got this problem when I'm, I'm trying to use online tools with them in, as a group. Yeah. That's why I. I turn to interview modes. Then I use for me the the frameworks yeah. and the spreadsheet that I needed to get to gather the information. But I, they don't they don't they don't. It's for me. They don't 
see. They don't realize what why, what we are doing. So right, it's my my perspective on this is that the, all of those tools they sound great in concept, yeah. but when you do it, people cannot see all the little prints, and so they cannot. They you know it's like looking at the thing behind me here. Yeah, is that if you couldn't read some of the words there, well, it's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. I can't. I can't. Look at it and go, yeah, that makes sense. That makes, oh, wait a minute, that's out of sequence. That needs to be moved. If I can't see and read that, which is why when I do the facilitated group process with flip charts and a huge wall behind me, I move everybody up within just, you know, four or five feet from the wall because, and the flip chart, and then I need them to be able to read what's on the yeah. wall. Otherwise, it's a, you know, wasted effort. So those are my preliminary questions for you and given some of the constraints that you have um one of them is you know with the number of people that's that's good how you're going to do this uh you, you know in a virtual meeting and you're going to need to chunk the meetings up the process which i have is seven steps which is the graphic here yeah. behind you on this this side um it, it, so, so I want to kind of talk through this, um, and you could do this virtually with virtual tools. You just have to be very careful that what is on everybody's screen, they can read, which means they need to be using a desktop because tablets and phones are too darn small for anybody to read, yes. you know, uh, anything other than, you know, one slide with big print at a time, and that's that's not good. So the the guidance that i wanted to give you um relates to this slide here and i'm going to be clunky here in terms of how i uh, uh point to <laughs> establish the path that's the first step and so what i would tell my design team who are all my rule is you cannot be on the design team if you weren't on the analysis team because my experience says that uh, a new member at this stage, they have to look at everything and, and question it and challenge it. And we find out that we're redoing the analysis data, the analysis effort in, while we're supposed to be doing design. So I established the training and development path or learning and development path or competency development, whatever you got to call it. But I say there's a beginning, middle and end. And in my graphic here on the table, which is the, the design arena, we would call it. Uh, there's a beginning and a middle and an end to the path. You start off learning something going down the path and there's stuff at the beginning, there's stuff in the middle and there's stuff at the end. And this is, um, um, you know, people, you, 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 if your design team knows that they can't teach everybody everything in the first, you know, 10 minutes, something has to come later. Something has to come earlier. And so that's the first thing is we talk with them about there's a beginning and a middle and an end to this path. At the end, you've learned a bunch of stuff and should be performance competent to some level. You may not be the master expert, but you'll at least be, you know, through the learning and now informal learning and social learning and experience and all of that takes place after that. So be, and it's important to establish this because we're going to sort data into the beginning, middle, and end. Now, when I have a lot of data, I have to tell my design team that the beginning itself has a beginning, a middle, and end. The middle has a beginning, middle, and end. And the end has a beginning, a middle, and end. And so instead of there being three segments on my path, there could be nine. And this helps people sort things as we're sorting things, they may get caught up in, well, you know, that goes in the beginning, but that, you know, it happens before this other thing that's already there. And so it's important for them to talk about the path and just mentally grasp, what are we talking about? So if the learner was to start at the beginning and get through the end, well, how long might that take? You know, what are we thinking? Is that is that a day, a week, a month, a year, five years? What What's the cycle time? That is would be typical, knowing that you know everybody else is atypical. But what what would that be so that they could go? Oh, we're talking about a thing that takes you know three weeks to get through or three months to get through. It's not you know a minute. It's not forever in a day. It's 
something. And so this is how the group begins to mentally uh, deal with a learning path, a performance-based learning path, and mm -hmm. about how long are we expecting? And so we're all on the same page. And I always tell them, you can say it's three weeks or three months right now and change your mind later. That's fine. But we at least are starting with the same thoughts in mind. We're all on the same page, blah, blah, blah. And so that's, to me, that's critical. And I've had clients before get frustrated because we're not moving fast enough. And, you know, and, and I need everybody to kind of lock in to, all right, this is what we're talking about. Something that's, you know, three weeks or three months or whatever. And, and so we can now begin to start sorting the data. And so the number two there is sort the PM data, which is the performance model data. This is where, you know, there's an output, there's a, a video script and there's a storyboard and there's a video and there's mm -hmm. a, you know, there, there's outputs with tasks. And I would call those things output and task clusters. Every major output, because you could have a video script that actually, you know, gets revised three times, you know, but if you know how to do a video script one time, you'll know how to update it and then update it again. And, you know, so that's not a critical to get into each iteration of a key or major output. So the first thing we're going to do is say, here's this first output. And it's, we start at the beginning of the analysis data and we systematically go through and take our analysis data and chunk it by output and tasks and the gaps that go with it and all the knowledge and skills that go with it. And we sort it into the path. This very first output, would we teach somebody that at the very beginning, in the middle or the end? Now, my experience says that some jobs are taught pretty much in the sequence that they would happen in the real world. We'll teach guy how to do an interview to, and then he'll create a script and then he'll create a uh, a treatment, and then he'll create a storyboard, and then we'll go shoot the video, and then we'll edit the video and have it done. You know, there's a sequence to something like that. And and so, but some some jobs I've found where you would actually do it backwards. You would begin with the, the end in mind. You would teach somebody the final thing, and then you teach them the thing before that. And, and so there's different ways that this can play out. And I tell the group, you know, th this is this is how you would like to do it and feel a need to do it. Not necessarily that you've always done it this way in the past, but maybe that works too. So, so where how do we sort all of this performance data output by output in the path? And we're basically sorting it into the beginning, the middle, or the end. We're not sequencing it yet. We're sorting it just to get it sorted out. Once we've sorted out all of that performance data, then we look at the path and we go to the beginning and we we sequence the outputs. Which output does, goes first? Which one goes second? Which one goes third? Okay. So we can always change our mind later, but we've got to start. And, and anchoring the path to performance is critical. And once we do that, we shouldn't be resequencing things. This is the anchor. So we sort all that. We sequence be the beginning of the path. We sequence all the outputs in the middle. We sequence everything in the end. And we step back and we go, does this work for everybody? Is this the right sequence? Let's make sure, because if we change it now, we're going to be increasing our workload to shuffle all this data around later on. And so... There's the big pregnant pause, the big review by the group. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets to talk about what they like or don't mm -hmm. like about what we're doing so far. But is this the this is the path we would use to train people on the job? And if that's good, then we begin with step three, which is sort the ETAs, which stands for existing training assessments. So if we've already got training that we've decided we're going to use as is, or after modification, which means we might take it apart and reshuffle some of that, mm -hmm. uh, versus there's training that we have that we're not going to use. It's excluded. So we've got stuff that we can use as is. Everybody goes, yeah, that's good to go. This other thing here, maybe it's out of date. Maybe it needs to be updated first. Okay, either way, course by course or lesson by lesson, however it can be configured, we would sort that next. Because we know 
we're teaching certain things in the, in the beginning, in the middle, and the end. So where does this training course that we've got go? Now, theoretically, the existing training enables my performance. So the ETAs, the existing training assessments, which are usually on a full page of paper, a definition of them, mm -hmm. can, be, can be a half page or whatever. But, but where does this go? We would place them right in front of the outputs and tasks that they theoretically enable. So now we're into sorting the existing training assessment data into the path right before the first time that enables. Now, if we've got a course that says, oh, it enables stuff in the beginning, in the middle, and the end, well, then we just need to teach it up at the front. And then when we get later on, when you would need it, you'd say, hey, remember when you learned how to do, you know, word processing? Okay, that you use that here too. Now, maybe it's a little bit trickier or different. We'll cover that. But otherwise, you already learned it. And so here's where you're going to use it again. So we, so the second part, the third part then is sorting this existing training stuff in place. Yeah. Now, when I get ready for this meeting, and if I've done the analysis you know, to a detailed level, which doesn't always happen, all the knowledge and skills for step four, some of those have been covered in the existing training. Either I figured that out beforehand or the group is going to figure that out now. So I take the very first knowledge and skill from the very first knowledge and skill category, however I've done that, and say, is this knowledge and skill item spreadsheets? All right. So is spreadsheet. So is it covered in existing training? Yes or no is the answer. If it is, then we don't have to worry about it because it's an existing training that we're going to use. Mm -hmm. So then I would tape it or staple it or something to that existing training uh, specification sheet. So we're dealing with sorting paper, but now you're in a virtual meeting. So how did I do this virtually? Well, you might have said the camera is on me and you can see my, my table in front of me with the beginning and the middle and the end. And I'm physically saying, here's this piece of paper. You can't see it now because of the <laughs> but but, but here's where I'm putting it. And now this next one. Okay, I'm putting it at the end. Whatever the group says, you know, and only if it, it sounds, if it doesn't make any sense, do you challenge them. Otherwise, you let mm -hmm. the group dictate this. And then you let them self-assess and challenge each other afterwards. But but so so they need to understand that what they're seeing, if they can't read it, they're mentally tracking so yeah. if you have to do this in a two-hour meeting, you might be able to establish the path, sort the performance data, and sort the existing training, and then stop. And then say, we'll meet again the next day or the next week or whenever. The trouble with breaking a meeting like this up is that people forget the details. They forget what's at the beginning, in the middle, and the end. So the next meeting, you'll spend time recalibrating the group, refreshing their memory about what did we put in the beginning, in the middle, in the end. And so they can go, okay, yeah, that, okay, that makes sense. All right. So, so you got to get them there. You can't just jump in and pretend or assume that they remember everything that they did. The, the more time in between the meetings, the more likely they're to forget it because of the forgetting curve. Yeah. Um, so, but, but the goal is to sort the performance down, the existing training with that, and then to take all of the knowledge and skills and sort them to where they go. And again, knowledge and skills enable task performance and producing outputs. So the um, so the the data the in in step three and four always goes in front of the data that you sorted in step two. All right, because you got to learn spreadsheets and you got to learn this policy. Now you can do the tasks and produce the output, right? So that's the sequence. And we're trying to reduce our rework by getting things as best we can in the right sequence from the very beginning. Otherwise, it's just a tremendous amount of work. Now, whatever data you're missing about 
existing training or knowledge and skills, you can recover from that later on in a review process. Somebody could say, oh, you know, we're, we forgot that course that we have on active listening. You know, and of course people need active listening. So where in the tasks and outputs do you first use active listening? Let's get this brand new active listening course in front of that. And, you know, of course, before we teach people active listening, we tell them, you know, why the heck they need to learn it. <laughs> what tasks and outputs does it relate to as kind of a preface, as kind of an advanced organizer? But but we don't worry about that detail now. We're just roughly sorting the data um, so that we can, one, establish that path, anchor it to performance, get the existing training in there, and then sort all the rest of the knowledge and skills that aren't already being covered by existing training. Mm -hmm. So that's the sorting and sequencing. And I take the group up and down the path multiple times because that helps them think about what's missing. They might go, oh, there's a knowledge and skills, there's that policy, or there's this law, or something that we didn't talk about before, but now mm -hmm. I'm thinking about it. Now I can say, okay, so we put it in the sequence where it goes. So we're always, we're doing analysis while we're doing design and get trying to get through these first four steps. And once we're sure that, you know, we're good to go. And so this may take you two meetings, depending on how long and how much data you have. But I would say, you know, try to get the, path and the and the performance data down and get the existing training because usually the existing training is is easier to place yeah. depending on how many discrete knowledge and skill items you've identified but if they're already embedded in your data with the tasks and outputs then it's a matter of simply um recognizing that later you know so it, it, if you've got the data and it's not segregated but linked if it's all mm -hmm. mushed together then, then you probably don't need to worry about step four, which is sorting the knowledge and skill matrix data. But so, okay, so now we've, we've taken our data and we've got it on the table in the beginning, in the middle, in the end. And we so we've sorted it. Everybody's happy with that. That's, the, that's a good sequence for most people. Maybe not everybody, but that's good for most people. And we've We've got the, the sequence within the beginning, within the middle, within the end. That makes logical sense. Yeah, there's other ways to do it, but that'll work too. So that's where we want to get our design team. So they go, yeah, that will work. I, I might have done it differently, but that would work too. I, can, I get it. Because there's a lot of arbitrariness about what do you have to learn first, second, and third before you do the fourth thing? Maybe yeah. one and three could be done in any order. It would be fine, but they have to be done before four. That's what you kind of want to get the group to, to acknowledge. So the next step then, five and six, is creating the modules and events. Now, in my design methodology, I have events and modules, which later become lessons. But right now, I don't want to get so fine-tuned that everybody locks into that. I want to just say, I'm creating modular path of events, which um are in a sequence so what i would do is i would go to the very beginning and look at the very first set of data and say we're going to create a module of content when you're done you've accomplished something you've learned something of value you know and and that could be a stopping point um so let's cluster the data what would go in this first module if there's going to be one module up at the front and what are we going to put in it and so you're just taking the data that's on the path and 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 sorting it in the first module and eventually somebody says no i would that next thing here i would that'd be in a different module oh okay so that's fine and now we start a second module so i have pieces of paper that say module spec and event spec and right now i'm working at the module level it's like we're working on the chapters of the book what goes in the first chapter okay this next thing here we've done that there's a there's 12 things in the first chapter this 13th thing oh no that would be a different chapter they would say oh okay good so i use the book and chapters analogy with with my teams too and saying you know you're looking at a bookshelf that's the path you're looking at the books that's the events you're looking at the chapters that's the modules someday they could become lessons um, but we're just trying to get this thing roughly organized. And so we go 
from the very beginning of the path to the very end, and we create chapters or modules. And everybody goes, okay, that's a logical way to group all the content for learning. And we're not talking about what's a job aid versus what's a learning experience yet. We're just going, this is, you know, what the learner experience is. They're going to learn this stuff first, then that, then this, and we go to the very end of the path. So we've taken all the data in the beginning, middle, and end of the path and organized it into modules. If the word module has a weird meaning for people, make something else up. Call it books and chapters, you know, because people get hung up on all, well, guy, a module to me is not, you know, I go, okay, what do you want to call it? And they'll come up with something, like, that's what we're calling it. And later on, they'll go, okay, go back to module. Yeah. You know, but, but so you're, you know, you're, we're dealing with people and, and the, the connotations of the language and the labels that we use. And so it's a, it's, it's a, there's cognitive dissonance in the room, always, <laughs> which is, would be the name of my rock group. You know, and I used to say this back in the uh, late eighties and early nineties, that if I had a rock group, it would, it would be cognitive dissonance. <laughs> um, but so so once you've got the modules laid down, all the data from the performance data and the existing training and the knowledge and skills are all now, they're all covered up by modules. And we might have a path with, you know, 27 modules on it and all the data is buried under the modules. We've taken all of our content and and, and organized it by chapters or modules. And so now the question is, okay, so how do we, how do we deploy this content, these modules? Is this first module an event? Or is the first two modules an event? Or the first three modules or what? So uh, one module can be one event. Or three modules can be an event. And this is when you're dealing with the master performers. Mm -hmm. Know to do the job. They know what makes sense. And yeah, there's some arbitrariness and you could have done it this way or that way. But eventually they can come to an agreement that, yeah, you can organize it to deploy this way into events. And so all we're doing is saying, hey, here's a bunch of chapters. You know, how many books do we have? Is this all one big book, one big training experience, learning experience? Or is this seven or is this 12? You know, we... So we're we're systematically going down the path, accumulating the data into first modules. And once that's all done, we go back to the very beginning of the path and read what we're, data we're working with so that we can do the eventizing, create mm -hmm. events. Now, I review the data as we're doing this each time. And I tell the group, you should be, as we're doing this, you're going to come up with things that we missed during the analysis that should be in here. Now is the time to talk about it. And yeah, later on, there's still time for recovery, but let's use this time to think about what we're doing and see if we're missing anything. Mm -hmm. And I, the facilitator, yeah, it's a big pain for me to have to go back and add this in there, but that's what our job is to do, is to try to get this to be a reasonable sequence of the data and to find the big holes in our own data because we were because of how we were rushed before or it just didn't come to mind or somebody told a story and that reminded me of that policy that I viol violated 10 years ago and got in trouble for. And so, you know, now is the time to try to recover from mm -hmm. what's missing. And so that takes you through uh, number six, you create the modules and then you create the events. And then step seven is cleaning up the path. So this is where I tell groups, you know, maybe there's not three segments to our path. Maybe there's five logical segments mm -hmm. or maybe there's two or maybe there's 10. So now's the time for us to just use the data that we've got and see how do we organize this? And most of my paths that started off with a beginning, middle, and end usually go to four segments. There's the, um, depending on, you know, what, what we're trying to teach with our path, a whole job, a whole process or whatever, maybe the process that we're trying to teach 
is a seven step process. Well, maybe our path should then have seven segments to reflect each of the steps because that's what we're going to teach. So we're not trying to create something that's new and different from what people already know and have to work with. We're trying to align to their real world. And if they say, you know, the professional association I belong to always talks about this as a seven step process. Well, then maybe it behooves us to organize all of our books and chapters or events and modules into that seven step framework. So again, the owner may that you're working with may have uh, an idea about, you know, how they would like it. And, you know, it's kind of arbitrary. It's just a way to present this to people. We don't say, hey, there's, you know, 27 events that you got to go through. You might want to say, you're going to go through three major learning experience sets. You know, the first one here, there's there's six courses, two group-paced, one self-paced, two e-learnings or whatever. And that's what's in there. And that either the, the titles make sense to people and they go, yeah, that sounds reasonable. And then in the middle and we explain it. And so we're just trying to figure out how are we going to organize this content and present it and deploy it? And how do we market it? That's the goal no, here so is, is to get to where we've created the modules or chapters and we've I, organized them into events or books and now we've got to go to step seven, which is to clean up this path. Now, what I had told people while we were doing this is that all the titles of the modules and the events that we've created are all the first draft at it. Now we want to clean up the titling so that it really makes sense. Once we can see the whole thing, we can determine how do we, what do we call these things, these events and modules? And people could have been arguing about something and they say, you know, I like to call it this. And somebody else says, call it that. And what Guy would do is he would write down this slash that. It's, it's you know, and, and not try to get into wordsmithing and arguing about any of that right now and trying to make final decisions. Because when we get to the very end, we're going to clean up the path. So we make sure that the sequence makes sense. I read everybody. Here's the title of the event. It's got three modules. The modules are titled this, that, and the other thing. And if you look at this, it covers these knowledge and skills and tools and mm -hmm. tasks. And so if people go, okay, yeah, that's, and I'm constantly reminding of that because I know that they may have a general sense of what's in there but I've, now I've got to review the details with them. And, and this is my last chance for them to call out anything that's missing. Because I don't want them to do that when we're doing a review meeting later on. So I want them to do it now. Now, we're always going to be doing recovery because completeness of content is the huge issue because of the non-conscious nature of knowledge, the automated knowledge, blah, blah, blah. And, and our working and processing all this data is stimulating the thinking of everybody in the room except for maybe that new person who doesn't know the details but has some questions. I always allow them to ask their questions because that's who we're serving. That's they represent the learner, right? And so mm -hmm. if they don't if something doesn't make sense to them, we better figure out what can we do about that because if it doesn't make sense to the person who watched us do this, it's going to be harder for the people who didn't watch us do this and didn't understand this. So we clean up the path. We look at the, the, the language, the titling that we've used. We make sure we're okay with how we've sorted that. I've had people say, you know, there's that thing in the third event that should go in the first. And everybody else looks around and goes, yeah, we agree. Okay, so we then we move it. And now everybody's happy. Okay, we're, we're moving it around. We're being flexible. We get through the whole path clean it up we make sure the sequence is right we make sure that the titling and what's the content is right and then we can look at okay so that was how to do the job and what you got to know to be able to do at the very beginning of the path what i always call the very first segment of the path is i call it the um onboarding and initial survival skills if, if the first event is got to be what guy needs as the learner to survive, what do yeah. I need that very first, you know, and if I'm teaching a whole job, 
that's where it goes. If I'm teaching a process, it's less critical, but there's some advanced organizer. There's the big picture. There's why are we concerned about this? What are the issues? What are the stumblings? What are the barriers to performance? And and so this is what we're trying to do. And these are the barriers and why it's easy or tough. Now let's learn how to do it. So that's where I would bookend, if you will, um, some of my path content with the immediate survival skills of somebody who's going to learn this. Um, and this gets into, you know, maybe there's something in the middle of the path that needs to be brought up to the front because that's where you can get yourself in trouble. And that's a decision that people need to make. So, uh, and then there, you know, so then are we going to do testing? So where's the testing go? Do we test at every module? Do we test at the end of every event? Do we test sometimes at the module level or, and sometimes after three events, then we test. So are we going to do testing? Yes or no. Uh, what's the nature of that test? Is it doing real work? Is it doing simulated real work? Is it doing a, you know, a, a knowledge test versus a performance test? These are the things that we can now embed into the path. Where do we test Guy the learner to make sure that he's tracking, that he's learning what he needs to? Because we don't want to get so far down the path that we find out too late that Guy didn't understand everything up in the first event. Maybe we should have tested for that. So there's political and philosophical issues that come up with you know the client. And the client gets to decide because they live with the consequences of whether... Yeah you know, what they should have done. Now, doing this stuff virtually again is tough. Yeah. So I would I would have the camera sitting back with you on, at a, some sort of a desk, and I would normally take my flip chart paper, and this is what I do in, when I'm doing this with a live group, is that I take several pieces of flip chart paper, tape them together, and say, this one is the beginning, this one is the middle, this one's the end. And now let's process the data. Now, they won't be able to see all the data, but they will be able to track it. So one of the things that I've used when I've had to do it this way is that I give everybody a copy of all the data and I give them a big red uh, marker pen. And I say, once we've processed it, cross it out or exit or whatever you do to say, we've, we've dealt with that. <clears throat> This allows two things. They have all the data in front of them <clears throat> in different rooms, in different parts of the country or the world, and they can process along with us. They may not know exactly where it went, or they might have written B or M or E on it to say, we put that in the beginning, we put this one in the end, this one in the middle, middle, middle. And so I'm, I'm allowing them to... Uh, get much more familiar and intimate with the data because they are doing something. They're not just sitting there. They can mark right. it off. And and I can't force people to mark it off, but I can encourage them to mark it off. And I encourage them to look at the data that we're working with because I want them to be thinking in the back of their minds what's missing. Yeah. What, what, what we, maybe we use three words when we should have used 12 to describe something because the three words could be misinterpreted, the 12 words less so. And so when I'm doing this virtually, I'm, I'm breaking up the whole seven step process. I'm sorting the data and asking people to help facilitate it, it, where they are by marking up the data as we walk through it. I've done this in meetings where everybody's in the room. Because people sometimes are skeptical as to whether we're going to be able to do good work. Yeah. Something's going to be missing, you know, and that's, you know, and, and my experience is that master performers are usually skeptical because they know most of the people in the world aren't master performers. Yeah. And they need to know that their voice is being heard. They need to be open to being challenged for clarifications you know, errors of omission, errors of fact, errors of omission are mm -hmm. easier to handle. Errors of fact, you know, hey, guy, you're wrong, dummy. You know, and so, 
So, but I want them to say, "Guy, you're wrong," because now let's examine what it, what's what's wrong. Is what you know? Is it wrong or is it missing something? And so, our goal here is to make something that our design team can embrace, that they can say, "This is good stuff." It may be mm -hmm. incomplete in the details, but we've covered the waterfront. We've covered it A to Z or Z, and uh, we're not missing anything except for the details. Um, and so that's what we're we're trying to get everybody to that point um, where they can agree with this. And then you go and document everything. Now, if you've looked at my book, Lean ISD, and you've looked at, you know, I've got examples in there of this is what a, a module spec looks like. And this is what an event spec looks like. You cr can create something here. But somewhere, every last piece of analysis mm -hmm. data has to end up in the design. And if it doesn't, if somebody says, you know, we said that when we were doing the analysis, but you know, now that doesn't really belong in here. I keep track of all that stuff. The group decided we didn't need to, to address this knowledge and skill item as an example, or we thought we were going to use that existing training, but now we've decided not to because yeah. um, people will forget. And other people that might look at this, if, you know, maybe maybe other people will look at this or they won't. But if other people would look at this, they might challenge this because that's how people do it. They challenge. They go, hey, where is such and such? Mm -hmm. You know, you either have an answer for them or you don't. Or you go, oh, we didn't we didn't cover that. So now where does it go? Is our openness to dealing with the with, with the likelihood, the assured likelihood that that we are not totally complete. We're missing things. And so now from here on, we're in the process of always identifying what could be missing and deciding where would it go and what's the implication of the overall design. It's no big deal. You put it in module three, you're done. You know, no big deal. Or no, now that's totally separate. We need a new module in between three and four, call it three A, three B, and then four, whatever, to make sure that mm -hmm. everybody's feeling comfortable with what we're doing. With this team, I... I, I'm have, I was having a hard time to get them on board to do the analysis, the analysis phase. Uh, then I remember this, this survival, survival basics that you have on the first, uh, on the first lesson. And I turned, I decided to do another approach that is in, in the book that, that is uh, use the level of details to get the analysis team uh, working. So we have a macro general business strategy, average with functional areas, and uh, micro, micro, it's uh, the specific task, tasks. So they, 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 just when I did that, they can, they, they, they finally grasp what we are looking for in the analysis phase. So you start to identify areas of, uh, areas of performance, and in, in general, we, like a stretch, and then uh, identify outputs in functional management and out in a specific tasks, out in specific output tasks. They they are critical to the business. Uh, yeah, I I try to, I I think because I think. It that decrease the the overload, the cognitive overload the uh, of the team on the analysis meetings. I'm trying to I, I will try to adapt the the, the process for CAD design using the level the level of details that you lay out in the book. How I don't know yet, but I will try. <laughs> yeah, so I mean that's it. So most people, my experience is, you know, I've dealt with. People who are systems engineers, mm -hmm. they get it. They they all go, oh yeah, what you're doing is creating a system of sub assemblies of raw good components. So whatever works in their world, you know. So whatever the nature of their work is, I look for something that's analogous to what I'm trying to do. Yeah. It's like if you're developing a plan, do you do an outline of the big major things, and then you go fill in the detail? Well, that's what we're doing here. Yeah. Our 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 events and modules and a path, the outline is the path, the major headers are the events and the 
you know, and then there's the next level of the, the modules, but then there's all the discrete knowledge and skills. I need spreadsheets here. I need communication skills here. I need my interpersonal skill of active listening here. You know, so there's all this micro stuff and all we're trying to do is organize it so that we can propose something that makes sense and that and we share it so that people can get their hands on it, so to speak, even though that you're the facilitator, but they can direct you, move this one thing upstream or downstream mm -hmm. because now I see it differently. Because they're, and, and we have to be careful of the cognitive load, the overload that we put on people when we do this kind of work. Um, but this is their world of work. And my experience is once they see what we're doing, they love it because mm -hmm. this is their real world of work and everything that you got to know to be able to do is now represented in this path. And they own, they should own this path. I always tell them, Hey, I don't own this path. You guys do. If this is garbage, that's on you, not on me. I'm just the facilitator, right? You guys are the ones who are giving input. You're doing reviews and approvals. You're, you're micro moving things around and macro moving things around. This is yours. I'm just the facilitator here. Yeah. And so, um, and I, and normally I would tell groups, okay, and I'm putting your name on the design document so that if this is a piece of garbage, it reflects you guys. I was just the facilitator. So, and, and I hope, hopefully they have a sense of humor and we can all laugh about that. And they've learned that I joke with them because I'm trying to take what we do seriously, but I'm not trying to take myself seriously or my process seriously. If you want to change the, what a guy calls things, go ahead, let's change it. I'll try to be consistent to the new language, but I've been doing this so long, I'll, I'll slip up every once in a while and call it by the old, my old language. But I, but I need to create something that works for them and resonates with their world and the new learners that are coming in because the new learners need to re relate to the that world. And so it's less about me and how what I like to call things is about what's gonna work for them. Yeah, I, read, I already worked remote with the, with another teams, but uh, never uh, all since the beginning. We are already have a, a, I, we already had a meeting, a live in-person meeting and later uh, we did something, some part of the, the process remotely. But uh, everybody always said, man, I'm just doing this remotely because we needed to, because man, <laughs> let's schedule a, re a meeting next week. We can't work like that. Once you, are, you, you have a, a uh, live meeting, analysis meeting of design meeting. The first time I start up a remote project from the start, it's yeah. different. That has, has its challenge. It, it, it is because when people can look at each other in the room and see their facial expressions, their body language, that's cues and clues for them to stop and think about something rather than if they're, if I'm pushing something, and I look at you and you're going, you know, I, I may go, wait a minute. Maybe I maybe I need to back up a little bit and explain what I'm thinking a little bit more. So the the dynamics of being in the same room um are totally different than this yeah. virtual meeting. And we don't get that sense. So as a facilitator, I find that I have to constantly remind people that the difficulties of doing this virtually it can be done but tracking the data and where did it go i have to look for some ways for them to go because because what we did 30 minutes ago is kind of blurry because we're dealing with some detailed stuff and and i can't keep all of that in my head and so if i give people paper copies of things and let them mark it off, mark it up whatever way they want to. Mm -hmm. I might give them a suggestion of a way or two to do it. But, you know, if we're putting something in the beginning, middle and end, mark it that way. And then later on, when we sequence those things into different modules, we can give a temporary title or 
a number to these modules so they can go oh that went in the beginning and it's in module three. Oh, and so they get to rehash the analysis data because the analysis data is so critical where did we put it does this make sense do i feel comfortable as a participant in this process that we're doing good work and it's so easy to get lost in the details that we, the facilitators, have to find ways to help people uh, deal with that and and their comfort or discomfort. And some people are, you know, they don't care, you know, whatever. You know, other people care. And yes. so as a facilitator, I've learned to use, identify the people who really care, who are really into the details, and use them to leverage the interest of the rest of the group so you know bob you you know you you agree with this and the, how about the rest of you, you know? <laughs> so i use bob because bob is a friendly or he's not bob hates us because he doesn't trust that we're going to do good work so i always go to bob and see if bob, and if bob goes yeah i guess so <laughs> okay is everybody else agree because he's the acid test he's the he's the non-believer and if he's kind of okay with what we're doing, doesn't want to commit himself, doesn't want to agree that this is good, but he'll grudgingly say, yeah, we're okay. Maybe that's what I need with the groups at all. You know, the group personality uh, starts off one way, is different in the middle, is different in the end. You know, I've had groups go from being very sour and negative to being less so in the middle and at the end they're champions and somebody else comes into the room wants to know what we're doing gets an overview they start mm -hmm. taking hot shots the group jumps up and defends us then you know you've got something uh, so so you so i take my as i assess what i'm doing with the group i can't judge whether it's accurate complete and appropriate i have to go by how the group seems to feel about it and be sensitive, super sensitive to their feelings about that. And then I need to probe. So if you think that we're so far so good, what are you worried about? And do the rest yeah. of you then share those worries? Um, and this is where, you know, I use a parking lot to say, okay, there's an issue. We're going to deal with that later. Let me put that in the parking lot visibly so that they know it's on the list. So they don't have to continue worrying about it forever. They know we've got it, so they can shift to their next worry or concern or what we're doing in the process. <laughs> I like to have uh, just to finish uh, our conversation. <laughs> uh, I like to have a snitch in the team, <laughs> a master yep. performer snitch. <laughs> that uh, the guy yeah. says, "What? How can we do that?" But Bob says, "Ah, I do this and I do that." I do snitch. Say, "Come on, Bob, you don't do this and do that." You do this, then you call John, then you do that, then you call Mary, and then you do this. Exactly. Come on, yeah, you have to do this. And, and that's where, as I a facilitator, I found that I need to talk a little bit about the non-conscious nature of knowledge, that we've automated yeah. certain things. When you are teaching your kid to drive a car, which could kill them and others, you as a parent are zoomed in and your kid is la, 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 you know, they, yeah. you know, and you know, you get serious about these steps that have to be taken. And, and so, you know, is one person might be not be so concerned because they, they trained their kid how to drive, you know, 30 years ago and there, it's no big deal. And yeah. they don't remember the trauma that the parent that's doing it right then. So you, you use the, the group here and you have to make it okay I've had to joke with groups to say, you know, instead of saying, Bob, you dummy, you're missing two steps. You, And I would joke with the group and say, if you feel like you need to say, guy, you dummy, you're missing two steps, say it. And the rest of us should know that what guy, what, what they're really saying is that guy, skip the dummy part. I think you're missing a few steps. But we talk to each other in a brusque way and challenge each other. And that's just sometimes who we are, but but we've got to be open to the fact that we as a group are trying to make this thing as accurate, complete, and appropriate as possible, and we're no doubt going to be missing things. 
you know, we have you ever driven home and got to your, into your driveway and said, did I stop at that stoplight? I don't know. But, you, you know, so we're on automatic pilot. And we're doing that when we drive a car, we're doing that in, you know, all, throughout the day. And we're just doing things because we're on auto. And yeah. and so our goal here is to make sure that we uncover some of the details of being on auto. You know, when you're driving from here to there, you got to stop at that stoplight or stop sign. Oh, and yeah. you got to be careful when you're entering the highway there because that's tricky and busy. And, and so people go, oh, yeah. And so to make it okay for the group, now the dynamics in a four-person group is different than a group of yeah. twelve. I see him. They have to work today, like uh, a EV, an electric car. I know how to drive any truck with a combustion engine, but I don't know how to start up a Tesla. I have no idea how to do it. <laughs> All yeah. right. So, um, any? I don't know if this was helpful or not. Uh, the whole nice. issue of dealing this virtually is you take this process and you have to chunk it out and end at a reasonable time. And every time you do the next meeting, you're going to have to go back and review what we've done so far, make sure everybody kind of remembers, and then begin the process. That's what's inefficient about breaking the process up into several meetings with yeah. time in between them. Um, but... Uh, it's, it's what I would, what I, what I call, I when I do this in a multiple day meeting, I I do at the end of the day and at the beginning of the day, a review preview. We review what we've done and we preview what we're going to do, and the next yeah. morning I do the same thing all over again because people have forgotten what we've done and what we're going to do, you know, and, and but but so it's just yeah, you know it's we just, always have to do that. It's exactly, and whether it's in a live meeting or a virtual meeting, but I think in the virtual meeting, it's more of a challenge mm -hmm. and making sure that everybody's paying attention in a virtual meeting. That's the hardest thing because people are sometimes multitasking. And since yeah. there's no such thing, they've switched over and are doing something else and they're not paying attention simultaneously to what you're doing. Yeah. So I have to look for the visual cues of where are people's eyes are they on you know at the at the camera on the screen wherever you know my camera is here and the screen is here yeah. but how do i assess whether or not guy is paying attention or if he's you know checking email so this is where i get the group to say you know if you need to take a break to check email let's everybody do that take a break at the same time so it, you know you if you don't pay attention you might embarrass yourself later on by saying, well, what about such and such? And somebody else might say, we did that seven minutes ago. Yeah. Where were you? Uh, and so, so I, I would say those things to people and they go, Oh, I guess I, I better pay attention here. And you know, when I need a break, you know, let's, let's yeah. all take a break at the same time. You, you need to remember that's that small stuff we do on, in a live event, on a live meeting, then go to the bathroom take a cup of coffee because yeah. the, our coffee in a meeting room or coffee it's the on the desk yeah. by, by our side and the bathroom it's uh, a door away when we are yeah, yeah. well all right so okay. any any final questions or anything um a lot but uh, that that what do you say you give me some some direction to to work on. It's the first uh, online remote uh, project since the start that I that I did, and uh, I see that I find that I find some challenge, challenges challenges yeah. when we are we are doing the analysis the analysis phase and the, the analysis uh, meeting, and now. The design, designing meeting, it's way more intense than the analysis, the analysis meeting. Yes. Uh, so yes. I was a, a little worried how to do that in the if I can do that uh, uh, through remote meetings, but okay. it can be done. Um, it, it takes it can a little be done. more time, a yeah. few more rounds. There yeah. is um, back. Uh, 
some work that I, as uh, the facilitator, have to do prior to to the meet, meeting and after the meetings to to get the the people on the same page and we call them we call them every uh, when we we to keep them in the in the moving in the flow when we are we are working yeah well, I, you know, so maybe when you're done with all of this, you can do an overview of, you know, your, your experience, you know, yes. what you were trying yes. to do, what was easy, what was difficult, yeah. what lessons learned and share that with others. Because I, I prefer working with groups of people and I prefer working with them face to face, mm -hmm. but in today's world, we have to yeah. do this virtually. And a lot of the tools that are available, I, you know, I see the little post-it notes and, you know, you put them here and there. And if you don't remember exactly what's what and where it went, yeah. you can't read it. You can't see it. You can't self-assess how well are, am I doing? How well are we doing? Oh. And that's the challenge with the virtual tools. If everybody had a giant screen in front of them where we could yeah. read all the post-it notes, that would work. If I could zoom in on a post-it note because I wanted to recall what was there, you know, but but the tools that I've experienced, I'm not up to date on all the tools now, but but you know, I I believe that they'll someday they'll get there and to help us do this kind of work. But but my experience is that there's some right. shortcomings in them and and the facilitator has to, you know, compensate for those shortcomings in the yeah. tools we use. But even with a real flip chart, I got lost sometimes. Uh, that I was, happens too, what, right? I mean, when I, I write there, I wrote that stuff that I did now. Yeah, exactly. Totally lost. Uh, that's why my rule is most of the time, not all the time, but when I'm doing flip charts, I never flip it over onto the easel. <laughs> I rip it off and tape it on the yeah. wall, and I move everybody's chairs up so they can read it and double check and. Um, but anyway, oh, yeah. well, good luck to you in doing this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'll, you know, if you need to ask me any questions or whatever, you just send me an email or whatever. We can do some of this that way. Okay. Uh, when I finish that project, I, uh, we talk again. I show what I, what I did to try to pull it, pull this out. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you guys.